our, we want to complete not only this conference, but also the entire economic and monetary union, like the session title says, which seems to be quite a heroic endeavor. Luckily, we have uh, with us two distinct experts who will help us to deliver at least on the first objective. Uh, I welcome Isabel Schnabel, professor at the University of Bonn and member of the German Council of Economic Experts. And I welcome Bruno Cabrillac, deputy director general of economics and international relations at the Banque de France. Welcome to both of you. Completing Europe's Economic and Monetary Union is the title of a significant report, the so-called Five Presidents Report of the European Union. And these uh, five presidents, which are, uh, represent the Commission, the Council, the Eurogroup, the ECB, and the Parliament, and it was published in 2015. But what exactly makes the European Monetary Union incomplete? Indeed, the number of institutions responsible for economic policy, and I named all five of them, already indicates that the EMU might have a governance issue. To put it simple, what makes EMU unique is that it does not have a single state. And since there is no political will to create the United States of Europe, the euro must mimic the most essential functions of a state. That is why the proposal of the five presidents report rests on four pillars. The economic union that promotes convergence, prosperity and social cohesion. The financial union that integrates banking and capital markets regulation, the fiscal union that guarantees sound public households and sufficient provision of public goods, and the political union that strengthens democratic accountability, legitimacy, and institution building. But be careful, complete does not necessarily mean perfect. Even the dollar area is far from perfect. Nevertheless, the language of the European Commission has become a bit more pragmatic when it now talks about deepening EMO. Since the crisis, a couple of measures have been taken to deepen EMO. For instance, the European semester made sure that economic policies have been better coordinated. Probably the biggest progress, progress has been made with respect to the banking union, although the important element of a cross-country deposit insurance scheme is still under negotiation. The process of the creation of a capital markets union has already been started, but its development will probably decades. The strength and stability and growth pact contributed to the fact that public debt is on a declining path in almost all member states. And meanwhile, the newly created European Fiscal Board helps not to lose track on the optimal fiscal stance of the Euro area as a whole. Many of these steps, measures and instruments sound familiar, as, we, as they have been mentioned by the previous speakers yesterday, remember? To avoid the repetition, I have asked the two speakers of this session to be much more visionary and to look more into the far future. Where they would like to see EMU in 2039, so in the next 20 years, will we need more than the current commissions and Franco-German consensual objectives? Will the five presidents report be implemented or will it be overtaken by another vision? I hope this gives you a flavor of the forward-looking spirit of this session. And let me now briefly introduce the two speakers of this session. Bruno Cabrillac is Deputy Director General Economics uh, and International at the Banque de France. He entered the bank in 1984 
as an economist in the foreign relation department. Then he was in the research and the forecast department. He was seconded to the Ministry of Finance as financial counselor in Cairo and Tokyo. In 1997, he was appointed head of the African department of the Banque de France. In the early 2000s, he became trade commissioner and Banque de France representative in Hong Kong and Macau, and later financial counselor for Africa at the French Ministry of Finance. Very much welcome. Isabel Schnabel is professor of financial economics at the University of Bonn and a member of the German Council of Economic Experts in Germany and we, in Austria, we know this under the name Sachverständigenrat, which is an independent advisory body of the German government. She is research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research and the CES IFO and research affiliate at the Max Planck Institute for Research on Collective Goods in Bonn. Isabel chairs the advisory council of the German Federal Financial Supervisory Authority, so called BaFin, and she's a member of the advisory scientific committee of the European Systemic Risk Board. Isabel, very much welcome. So we start uh, as it is written in the program, and we start with Bruno, and may I ask you to give your presentation. So let me begin by uh, two thanks. Uh, the first thank is uh, to the organizer, the uh, OMB and uh, the CUF uh, for uh, the invitation. And the second thanks is uh, for the chair uh, to uh, ask me to be a visionary, which uh, will uh, allow me to focus on the longer term issue, the difficult uh, dynamic uh, between convergence and integration, and uh, which gi will give me uh, maybe more leeway uh, than, in, than if I had uh, to focus on, um, on short-term issue. And by the way, uh, Isabel is probably uh, much better to um, uh, give you, uh, to deliver you uh, the, the solution for uh, fixing uh, the EMU in the short to the, um, uh, the medium term. But uh, I must uh, say uh, that in any case, uh, the disclaimer stands, uh, even on the, on the vision. This is uh, not necessarily, of course, the vision of the, um, of the, uh, the, the Banque de France. So, um, let me begin by uh, just a short reminder, uh, even if it is a little bit in contradiction with uh, what I just said, uh, on uh, the recent past and uh, the fact that we have, uh, we have done uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. And this was mentioned uh, by uh, many uh, yesterday, and uh, including uh, President Trichet. Uh, we have done a lot, uh, but uh, the acceleration is uh, mainly uh, occurred during the, uh, during the crisis. So it's consistent with the famous uh, Jean Monnet quote, and uh, uh, President Trichet uh, uh, did another quotation of Jean Monnet, but. Uh, the, the famous uh, uh, Monet quote uh, is the people only accept change when they are faced with necessity and only recognize necessity when a crisis is upon them. Uh, I know that this is uh, something which is uh, often said uh, and often said for uh, Europe, uh, but uh, it's uh, still uh, true and probably uh, one of the things uh, we will uh, um, have um, uh, to uh, improve in the euro area its, its capacity uh, to make progress and to deepen in uh, quiet uh, times. And so to find the institutional settings, uh, but also the narrative. And the narrative is very important, uh, probably to do it uh, in quiet times. Now, and uh, if we consider that uh, we are in quiet times, uh, which is uh, by uh, uh, many ways uh, disputable, uh, we have some opportunity to uh, have not uh, so high hanging fruits uh, at, um, at our end. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we probably uh, uh, have an um, uh, easy, um, easy step uh, or not so an easy step uh, to take. Um, the Meserberg uh, roadmap is giving, uh, is giving probably a taste of what is achievable but also a taste of what is unsinkable. So 
I won't go uh, through uh, the main measures of the Mesomeg uh, roadmap, uh, and I guess uh, that um, uh, Isabel will uh, discuss uh, further these issues. Uh, but the Meserberg roadmap, uh, if you are uh, reading it um, 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 in, in, in depth, is also indicating the current, uh, but also probably there for quite a long time, uh, the current and strong red lines. Uh, debt mutualization and permanent public transfers, which are probably uh, uh, red lines which are there for a long time. And the reason behind that is that there is no uh, uh, real narratives to justify that. Okay, let's come back to the, uh, to the issue of the, um, the dynamic between uh, convergence and integrations. If uh, we look at the uh, EU real convergence, uh, the story is uh, quite well known. Uh, it worked well for the new members in the Eastern Europe, but um, it didn't work in the last two decades since the beginning in the euro uh, for the group in the southwest part of this graph, uh, known as the peripheral country, Cyprus, Portugal, Spain, Greece, and in fact, uh, if you look uh, a little bit further, uh, it is uh, not working uh, also, and probably it won't um, work in the, in, in the future uh, for countries like, uh, like Italy. So, looking at, looking, uh, looking at that in the, in the future, uh, we can uh, try to look at uh, the main, uh, the four main uh, economies in the euro area and try to extend the trend of the real GDP per head uh, to um, the horizon which was fixed by the chair, so it's 2038, the next 20 years. Uh, if we are extending the trend from the last two decades, uh, you see that uh, these, these are diverging. Uh, but if you are uh, extending the trend of the last decade, then the divergence is even more significant and is uh, striking. Is it reasonable to extend the trend? Uh, as it was mentioned uh, by the OECD, by Luis Di Mello uh, yesterday, uh, most of the um, divergence in the GDP per head is coming from uh, the uh, total factor productivity and there is a lot of inertia in the total factor productivity. So it's not uh, completely uh, unplausible uh, to extend the trend for the next, uh, for the next 20 years. And then uh, we have to face that uh, we cannot take for granted that uh, integration uh, and even deeper integration than now will uh, automatically uh, produce um, convergence and real convergence. Okay. If we are taking also the um, uh, demographic, the demography, um, the, uh, all the uh, euro area countries are facing with a similar demographic shock of uh, an aging shock, uh, but it is not of the same magnitude. And uh, as uh, you can uh, see on the figures, uh, the um, uh, for example, uh, the divergence in the old age dependency ratio uh, will increase in the uh, next, uh, in, in the next uh, 20 years. So it's something which has to be taken into account. It's something um, which uh, has to be taken into account uh, and, it, and is important uh, may, uh, also because um, also because uh, the um, uh, policy uh, um, and uh, the, um, uh, the way the countries are following the uh, recommendation, as it was uh, uh, said yesterday, not to do politics at the expense of the next generation is probably not the same uh, in the main euro area countries uh, and not the same across uh, euro area countries. And uh, again, yesterday, Luis uh, de Mello uh, um, mentioned uh, and illustrated the divergence on the way uh, euro area countries uh, are dealing with labor supply for all, of older workers. 
So it is increasing also the um, um, divergence of the uh, response to this, um, to this demographic, uh, demographic uh, um, uh, challenge, shock. So it's probable that uh, if we don't do anything, we are going to live with uh, real divergence. How much it matters? Well, if you uh, assume that there is perfect uh, intra-euro area labor mobility, uh, then real divergence becomes only a problem of territory planning. Of course, it's a quite a, um, a, a theoretical view, but in this case, uh, you don't need a, a, a lot more transfers than now. Uh, you just need limited additional uh, intra-euro area transfers for public investment in infrastructure, but you can argue that uh, you don't need any change of scale uh, of European and structural and cohesion funds. You can wonder if you don't need some uh, uh, mutualization of public education cost, uh, at least during the transition period, because, uh, for example, the brain drain uh, should be a win-win, um, uh, should be a, a win-win uh, solution. And still, you have to deal with a legacy problem because uh, the national debt will remain uh, even if uh, there is labor mobility. And in this case, uh, if labor mobility is a way uh, to make, um, to make real divergence more uh, politically sustainable, uh, then uh, you have to uh, have policy to uh, encourage uh, labor mobility. And uh, one of them, cross-border pensions right portability, is key. It doesn't mean uh, any mutualization uh, of pensions, but uh, it's, of course, uh, um, uh, key to uh, ensure more labor mobility. But we are very near, very uh, far away, sorry, from, uh, from uh, labor uh, mobility. If you look, for example, at um, uh, underemployment or uh, an, an employment, uh, not only the uh, level of unemployment or underemployment are diverging a lot, uh, and we are diverging a lot at the uh, beginning of the euro, uh, but they diverge a lot also uh, with the crisis, and, and, and even more. So this is a, a quantity index of divergence of labor, uh, of labor markets, but there is also a, a, a much well-known um, price index of divergence of uh, labor uh, markets, which is the uh, labor cost index, with, uh, which, uh, as you know, and uh, President Trichet mentioned that uh, quite a lot uh, when he chaired the ECB, uh, diverged a lot during the first uh, decade uh, and didn't, uh, in fact, uh, adjust completely uh, during uh, the second decade of the, um, of the euro. Um, same thing for uh, youth uh, unemployment rate, so I won't insist on that. Um, if you look uh, also uh, at uh, how much uh, workers uh, are, uh, how much uh, there, are, there is uh, intra-euro area workers' mobility, if you are taking the uh, EU uh, statistic, you see that the level uh, of uh, working age people which have been born in another uh, euro area country uh, is uh, quite low. Uh, um, Le well, around 5% of the working age population. And uh, it increased, but it in, in increased uh, much less uh, than the proportion of uh, non-euro area uh, born, uh, non-euro uh, area uh, uh, born countries. So, uh, integration of um, uh, labor market is uh, just uh, an uh, in infant stage. Another thing which is, uh, of course, uh, quite uh, important uh, for labor mobility, but uh, also for uh, real divergence, and uh, what we can say about real divergence in the future, is the heterogeneity of uh, level of education and spendings. Uh, if you are taking, for example, the capability uh, in science on the PISA uh, survey, uh, 
uh, you can see that the levels are uh, diverging between the four main, uh, the four main uh, uh, euro area economy. And if you look uh, at the projection uh, in the aging report of the uh, European Commission on education spending, you see that uh, also the levels are very different uh, and will diverge uh, in the future. So this is an important failure, uh, which is, uh, all of course, uh, an impediment uh, to labor mobility, but uh, is also a, a, a factor uh, which uh, uh, it will probably uh, increase uh, real divergence. Well, exactly the same thing if we take the uh, PIAs. PAAC uh, survey from uh, the uh, OECD, we see that uh, uh, the percentage of adults scoring at each proficiency level, uh, both in literacy and numeracy, is very different from country to country. Again, uh, a drag on labor mobility, probably, uh, and again, uh, uh, an indicator that uh, um, we uh, have to expect uh, real uh, divergence uh, if we don't take the right, the right policies. So, uh, if, if, we, uh, if we assume uh, that uh, there is a, a desired imperfect intra-euro uh, mobility, or if we assume that uh, we are so far away from a real labor mobility that uh, it will take uh, quite a long time uh, to take it, then, uh, and we, if we think that the real divergence is uh, inevitable, uh, in fact, real divergence could be uh, worsened by labor mobility. And this is uh, the seminal article from uh, uh, Paul Krugman in 1993. Uh, a more integrated market leads to divergence in both the economic structure and the growth rate of regions. And there is a really a need of risk sharing, uh, risk sharing to address idiosyncratic shocks and smooth uh, cyclical divergence, uh, but also risk sharing to mitigate structural divergence. Private risk sharing uh, through global financial integration can help a lot, especially on the first uh, point uh, to uh, address idiosyncratic shocks uh, and smooth cyclical, uh, cyclical uh, divergence, but uh, the question is, would it be enough? Uh, and um, uh, again, if we are uh, um, rereading the, lesson, the lessons of Massachusetts for EMU, uh, and I quote Paul Krugman, uh, in the US, the heavily federalized fiscal system offers a partial solution to the problem of regional stabilization. Unless there is a massive change in European institution, this automatic question will be absent. And it remains partly true. It means that uh, we have a, we have a trade-off uh, between um, um, between um, heavily heavily federalized fiscal uh, system or or accepting uh, real divergence uh, at least uh, at uh, the horizon of 20, uh, 20 years. Uh, and uh, Jean-Claude Trichet reminded us yesterday that. Uh, it took uh, 100 and more than 100, more than a century uh, to have um, uh, efficient integration uh, in the uh, monetary and economic integration in the US. So, uh, just, a, uh, just a flashback, uh, and it's again a very well known story on what happened during the, uh, the crisis. Uh, during the first uh, decade of the euro, we uh, um, uh, had, in fact, um, uh, quite a, a, a big divergence. This is the uh, uh, real uh, um, exchange rate um, based, on, uh, based on unit uh, labor cost. So it's uh, the picture, uh, um, the slide I showed uh, just a few, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, but translated in a uh, real effective exchange rate. And so a big divergence uh, during the first uh, decade before the crisis. And post-crisis, uh, in fact, uh, the uh, nominal, uh, this nominal divergence was corrected, but just partially, and, uh, and uh, for, uh, for, for a small part, I would say, on it. Uh, 
But even that was very painful. And uh, I took this uh, graph from uh, um, the um, a, a working paper on, uh, of the ECB um, on the first 20 years of the uh, ECB monetary policy. And uh, if you look uh, at the two graphs, you see that there is a strong negative uh, correlation uh, between the current account balance in 2007 and the unemployment rate in 2013. So it means that to correct uh, the current account balance, uh, the, country, uh, the, the, the price paid by the country was a very high unemployment rate. Uh, and it's uh, uh, the same thing if you look at it in terms of a unit labor cost, there is a, a, a positive correlation between uh, the unit uh, labor cost the level of the unit uh, labor cost uh, in 2007, in two, uh, between 2002 and, two, and 2007, and the unemployment rate in 2013. So, meaning that the adjustment uh, and only partial adjustment uh, of the unit labor cost post crisis, um, or during the crisis at least, uh, was, uh, was, quite, uh, was quite painful. If you look at financial integration, uh, then uh, it's uh, also a very uh, well-known story. Uh, it's a bumpy pass, and it's uh, very pro-cyclical. Um, a, a lot of increase, and this is the index quantity-based uh, fin financial integration uh, composite indicators and the price-based financial integration composite indicators computed by the uh, ECB. And, uh, you see that uh, there, during the first phase, uh, before the crisis, a big increase of financial integration, again, pro-cyclical, and then uh, a slump uh, during, during the crisis. Okay, three minutes left, so uh, just uh, maybe uh, three points to, to, fin to, uh, to, finish, to, to finish it. Uh, real divergence, uh, it, it matters. It matters also uh, in terms of flows, but it matters in terms of, um, of stocks. Uh, and uh, it's important to notice that uh, there is a, a very unpleasant uh, arithmetic due to the fact uh, that the numerator and the denominator uh, are uh, uh, going in the same way and uh, are completely diverging if we look at the debt to GDP, uh, the public debt to GDP uh, ratio, um, and so um, uh, so um, um, real divergence is uh, also a problem uh, because it is increasing uh, the divergence uh, on the way out of the public debt uh, debt trap um, in in Europe. Uh, just to mention that uh, if uh, the debt situation. The public debt uh, situation has improved, in fact, slightly in the last uh, few years. Uh, the divergence uh, of the GDP, um, of the uh, debt, public debt to GDP ratio uh, has uh, worsened, uh, in fact, and is still, uh, is still a, a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, worrying. And maybe a final, a final point of uh, what, uh, what could be the, um, the uh, agenda for uh, the uh, EM, EMU uh, in 2038. Um, well, to focus on a very long-term perspective, uh, I just uh, had the idea to uh, look uh, at the EMU deepening uh, in the perspective of a globalized world. And the first step uh, in the uh, EMU was the customs union uh, made by the uh, Rome Treaty. But, uh, and, uh, of course, it's dip disputable to assume that, that uh, the globalization will uh, go on. Uh, but uh, at least if we think that the globalization will uh, go on, uh, we have seen uh, in, the, um, um, in, the past, um, uh, in the past 20 years that the comparative advantage of a custom union has, has decreased uh, because the tariffs have uh, decreased uh, all over the world. Uh, it stopped, but uh, we can maybe assume that it stopped only for a while. Uh, and in this case, um, uh, there is a less uh, comparative advantage in a custom unions. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit the same, and uh, I won't insist on that for the sake of time, uh, for the uh, financial integration. 
the comparative uh, advantage of financial integration inside the EMU uh, is uh, probably, uh, again, if globalization go on, uh, is uh, probably going to uh, diminish uh, just because there is diversification all over the world uh, of the portfolio and the uh, equity on bias is decreasing, uh, uh, as you can see on this graph, uh, and will probably uh, go on decrease, uh, decreasing uh, in the US, uh, in the euro area, and in all advanced economies. So, if uh, there is an agenda for the European Union uh, in uh, 2038 and beyond, uh, it has to be an agenda which allows the uh, European Union and the euro area uh, to keep uh, being a step ahead uh, of the uh, global integration in the world. The first point is uh, probably to achieve the single market, including for financial services, and the point was made uh, again uh, uh, yesterday morning by uh, Luis de Mello, especially on personal services, there is still a lot to do uh, to achieve the single markets in terms of uh, norms also, and for example, the uh, solvability, uh, the solvability regime, harmonization of the solvability regime is not only useful for capital market integration, is uh, very useful probably, uh, especially if it is an upward harmonization to, uh, fav fav uh, to, uh, um, uh, to accelerate the uh, creative uh, destruction uh, uh, process, uh, which is uh, probably uh, important for uh, increasing potential growth in the uh, European Union. Strengthen the institutional integration. Uh, it's something, uh, of course, uh, which was mentioned uh, by, the, uh, by the chair uh, and the five president uh, report. Uh, beyond strengthening the institution, I think uh, we have to find also the right narratives uh, to, uh, uh, to, to talk to the people. More labor market integration is probably needed. It's a way to make uh, acceptable uh, real divergence, if uh, real divergence has, uh, um, and real divergence has to be uh, uh, accepted, uh, at least uh, to a certain level. And upward education level harmonization is very, uh, is very important, not only to uh, increase labor market integration, uh, but also because it's the most important uh, thing uh, to, uh, to solve uh, both uh, the, um, um, uh, the real uh, divergence inside the euro area, uh, but also maybe uh, to face, to deal with the challenge of secular stagnation in uh, Europe, uh, which is probably the uh, main uh, obstacle uh, to, um, uh, to the deepening of uh, economic and the economic and monetary union. much for this uh, analysis. Uh, the result is not uh, very rosy. Gloomy picture, no real convergence, <laughs> no more real convergence. And uh, thank you for setting up this 2038 agenda. Now we will come to Isabel and she will tell us about the architecture, how she sees it. So thank you very much for, uh, to the organizers for having me here and talk about uh, uh, a topic that is really dear to my heart, which is uh, Europe and the architecture uh, of, the, uh, of the Euro area. And let me start with a, cro uh, a quote by a great European uh, who said, our future is Europe, we do not have uh, another one. And uh, I think this is a very true statement and I think we should take this uh, very seriously when thinking about the needed uh, reform efforts. So uh, Doris asked us um, to uh, present our vision uh, of the Euro area and to be bold and visionary. And actually, um, this is uh, what we did in a group of uh, seven German and seven French uh, economists last year when we published a report uh, on Euro area reform. And uh, this report has actually received uh, a lot of attention. And I think one of the reasons is that um, the group of people who wrote this report was actually quite uh, heterogeneous. 
So uh, there were people where most observers would have thought would have had um, would have very different views on the euro area. And I can tell you, actually, it wasn't so hard to find a consensus on these issues. And this, I would say, gives me some hope that in Europe we actually could find um, 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 a consensus on these uh, issues in spite of, the, uh, of certain red lines that exist. And actually, um, you mentioned two red lines, which were debt mutualization and uh, no permanent transfers. And actually, we are respecting those, uh, those two red lines. I think even if you respect those, there remain uh, red lines, and I will, I will talk about them uh, in, in some detail. So let me start with the diagnosis. And my di diagnosis is that the euro area still remains fragile. And uh, I, I think it's very important to acknowledge that. And uh, I think most uh, politicians uh, have kind of lost this sense of urgency that something needs to be done. So the feeling is that the crisis is more or less over. And so we don't have to do much. And uh, I would like to convince you that this is maybe uh, not a good uh, position to have. So what we're seeing is a slowing expansion of the uh, global uh, economy and, uh, of course, also a slower expansion uh, in the euro area after a relatively uh, long boom. Uh, there are high risks. Um, there is a trade conflict. There's Brexit. And there's also always a risk that the euro area crisis may come back. Of course, we've made a lot of progress. And it was mentioned already by uh, Bruno. I mean, we have new or improved institutions. The uh, European Banking Union, which I think is crucial. The European Stability Mechanism for Crisis Management. Uh, we have reformed the Stability and Growth Pact. We have new regulation like Basel uh, III. Uh, but nevertheless, there are quite a few problems that have not been resolved. So there still are very high public debt levels in many member states. We've seen, of course, this sharp increase in public debt during the global financial crisis. But then afterwards, we've seen that the relatively good times have not been used sufficiently in order to consolidate. And I think this is partly due to the fiscal framework, which has proven to be pro-cyclical, relatively ineffective, and also politically divisive. What it means now that we still have these high debt levels is that fiscal space in the next crisis or recession is limited in many member states, excluding, of course, most importantly, Germany. At the same time, monetary space is also quite uh, limited. So uh, I would argue that the macroeconomic situation would have allowed for an earlier normalization of monetary policy, but this has not happened. And now, of course, the slowing growth makes the exit from loose monetary policy unlikely. And, uh, but uh, what, uh, what this means is that actually the euro area will not be able to rely on the ECB to the same extent as it has done in the last crisis. I think this is something that is relatively uncontroversial. The European banking sector remains weak. Of course, capital ratios are higher. In my view, they are not high enough. Of course, NPLs are lower, but in my view, they are not low enough. There has been quite a bit of risk-taking, uh, not least due to, due to the low interest rate environment. Exposures to domestic sovereigns remain very high, and the profitability of banks is structurally low. As mentioned already by uh, Bruno, there is uh, relatively little risk sharing in the euro area. We have seen a very similar graph in the previous presentation. There was this sharp drop in financial integration after the financial crisis, which was mainly due to the fact that the financial integration that, that we have seen proved not to be uh, very resilient in a crisis because it was mostly interbank loans which disappeared basically in the middle of the crisis. And so uh, the, the, um, the risk sharing wasn't really there when it was needed most. Uh, the banking and the capital markets uh, are still uh, very segmented in Europe. And uh, so th there, there is very little financial risk sharing in, the, in addition there's uh, virtually uh, uh, no fiscal risk sharing. 
That this matters could be seen very clearly in the last year when we saw that um, in the context uh, of the, the Italian government formation and budget negotiations, uh, we saw this sharp rise in Italian government uh, bond spreads. Um, and this was actually quite uh, dramatic. And of course, on the one hand, it's a good sign because it seems there was some market discipline. And actually, you could also say that it partly worked because the government uh, actually uh, became a bit, the Italian government became a bit more careful when they saw these, uh, these harsh market reactions. But there are also studies showing that this increase was partly driven by redenomination risk. And this also shows up in the transmission of these increases to other euro area countries. And of course, then we had this transmission to Italian and other European banks, which shows that the sovereign bank nexus is alive and well. And of course, this makes the issue uh, much more harmful. So this tells us that the euro area is still unstable. We've seen in the past years a rising popularity of EU membership, partly but not only related to uh, Brexit. But on the other hand, we see a very large heterogeneity uh, across countries. And in quite a few countries, we are seeing political polarization and anti-European um, movements. And it seems that the crisis management ha has actually contributed uh, to that. And what is, uh, what is interesting is that we are seeing that, um, that neither the debtor nor the creditor countries were, uh, were very happy. So the creditor countries had the feeling they, they were paying for other people's mistakes. The debtor countries had the feeling that they had been unfairly imposed uh, austerity um, uh, programs. So the, um, the summary of this, this first part is that the status quo of the euro area remains unstable. The recovery has relied, to, uh, has relied strongly on the ECB. This won't be possible in the future because there is limited monetary space. At the same time, there's limited fiscal space, so it will be much more difficult to deal with the next recession or crisis. So at the same time, there is something like a, a deadlock uh, which delays the, or slows down the reform process. And as we argue in this report, this is partly due to what we call different philosophies. And um, I think this really poses a threat to the stability of the euro area. So let me explain uh, what I mean by this. So here I use the labels German and French, but the, the, these should not be taken literally. So they are, they are more like labels. So what is the German view? So the German view is that we should emphasize the unity of liability and control, more market discipline, incentive compatibility, fiscal discipline, enforceable rules, and in any case, we shouldn't have a transfer union. The French view argues that we should emphasize um, the need to ensure against asymmetric shocks, we should avoid pro-cyclicality, and we need safe um, uh, assets. And of course, these different philosophies translate into different policy implications. So the German view would prescribe yet that you need an orderly restructuring of sovereign debt, uh, credible fiscal rules with sanctions, and removing the privileges for sovereign exposures of banks. Whereas the French view would argue you need uh, fiscal capacity, European deposit insurance, and safe assets. And the central point of our report was that it's actually a mistake to argue that these two philosophies are uh, contradictory. But quite uh, on the contrary, we argue that risk sharing and market discipline are complements, that they actually belong together. And wh what I would like to stress is that this paper is not a political paper. We are not talking about forming packages, reform packages that are acceptable for political reasons. But this is an economic paper which argues that a consistent approach to euro area reform has to have both elements, risk sharing and market discipline. Let me give you the argument in a nutshell. So, um, risk sharing, uh, so if you don't have discipline, risk sharing 
will tend to lead to moral hazard, and this is not sustainable in the longer run. So it's clear that you need some type of discipline. However, we've seen very clearly that if you have disciplining devices that are merely uh, based on administrative or political procedures, that they are very hard to uh, enforce for political reasons. And this is where market discipline comes into play. However, we also have to acknowledge that market discipline alone will not be enough because market discipline without risk sharing will be destabilizing and therefore it cannot be uh, credible. So to give you an example, you cannot say that you no longer bail out banks if you do not have some stabilizing features that prevent a meltdown of the entire financial system. And therefore risk sharing and market discipline belong together and one cannot work without the other. So this leads us to a certain important elements of your area re reform. So the first is that we need to strengthen the financial architecture with two main features, breaking the sovereign bank nexus and creating a, a European banking and capital market. The second is that we have to raise the credibility of the fiscal framework. So uh, we argue for an expenditure rule that is less procyclical and better enforceable. And second, we need rules for credible restructuring of sovereign debt as a last resort. And finally, we need more stabilization through a European unemployment reinsurance with an incentive compatible design and without permanent transfers. So let me go through these uh, three areas um, one by one. So let me start with the financial architecture, which I think is crucial. And uh, at the core of this is always the question, how can we break the sovereign bank nexus? And uh, as we all know, there are various connections between the state uh, and, and the banks. And there are these direct connections. And one of them is uh, through implicit or explicit government guarantees, which is, of course, bank rescues on the one hand, but also very importantly, and what people tend to forget, deposit insurance, because deposit insurance can only be credible if uh, it has an implicit government backstop. So this creates uh, a connection uh, from, the bank, uh, uh, from the weaknesses of banks to the weaknesses of sovereigns. In the other direction, uh, it goes through the holdings of sovereign debt um, uh, of banks, and this again creates a direct connection between the problems at sovereigns, which are then transmitted to the banks. But then, of course, there, in addition, there are indirect uh, connections uh, which run through the domestic economy. So uh, if there is a sovereign debt crisis or if there is a domestic banking crisis, this will have an impact on the domestic uh, economy. And uh, how big this impact, and, and then in turn, uh, it will uh, feed back into uh, problems at the uh, sovereign or at the banks. How strong these feedbacks are depends very much on whether we have a European capital market, which implies that uh, firms in need of funding uh, can shift from bank funding to capital markets funding. And it also depends on how well the banking sector is integrated, because if the banking sector is highly integrated, this means that if domestic banks are in trouble, firms can switch to other European banks. And the same that uh, if, the, if the European banking sector is integrated, a domestic problem will not affect the domestic banking sector to the same degree. And this leads us then to, uh, uh, to the most important financial sector reforms, which is um, the uh, a credible resolution regime, which includes a common fiscal backstop, and importantly, a special liquidity facility for banks in resolution. The second issue is that we need a well-designed European deposit insurance scheme. The third is that we have to end regulatory privileges for sovereign exposures. The fourth is that we need a European banking market, which in my view implies that we should phase out options and national discretion, that we should remove obstacles to pan-European mergers, and that we should, uh, certainly should not form national banking champions. Um, then the next point, we need a well-developed European capital market. And what is important and what the 
uh, what the crisis has taught us is that we need to foster resilient capital flows, and uh, this is uh, especially uh, equity, uh, equity flows. And uh, this is, I think, one of the main goals of the Capital Markets Union, and it could be done, for example, by removing the debt bias uh, in taxation. And what I also think would be important is to expand the competences of the European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA. One issue that actually the, the group, the 7 plus 7 group, did not in the end agree on is whether there is a need uh, for a European safe asset. Uh, I think there are uh, quite a few arguments why one may need such an asset. And actually, one of them is also related to, the, uh, to ending the privileges uh, of uh, sovereign exposures. Uh, because, of course, what we, uh, if we end, uh, uh, if we want to uh, ensure that there is more diversification in sovereign bond holdings at the banks, this means uh, that uh, some banks will have to move into riskier assets, actually. So German savings banks shifting uh, into Italian government bonds, let's say, right? And not everybody may think that this, is, uh, that this is the best idea. So the question is whether in that context a European safe asset may be needed. Let me, uh, let me move on to the uh, fiscal framework. So in academic circles, there's actually now quite some agreement that one should switch to a fiscal expenditure rule, the reason being that the current rules are too hard to enforce and uh, that they are pro-cyclical, meaning that they, are, um, uh, that they have too little bite in good times and that they are too harsh in, uh, in bad times. So the general idea in all proposals is that the uh, expenditures should no, not grow faster than uh, nominal uh, GDP and that they should grow more slowly uh, if the country misses some long-term uh, uh, debt target, which could be the 60% from the Maastricht uh, Treaty. Uh, one very important uh, question is how you can make such rules enforceable. And the proposal that we adopted in this report was uh, that uh, one, uh, one uh, could force countries to finance excessive expenditures through junior debt, so what uh, some people have called accountability bonds, in order to, um, uh, to introduce an element of market discipline here, uh, admitting that uh, th other types of discipline haven't worked so well. The second important issue uh, is uh, the, the question of orderly sovereign debt uh, restructuring, which is needed if you really want to make the no bailout rule uh, credible. Importantly, we do not argue for an automatic debt restructuring of the stock of debt uh, because this could lead to self-fulfilling uh, e effects. However, there should not be ESM loans given to insolvent countries without debt uh, restructuring. Um, there are always holdout problems which uh, should be mitigated uh, through comprehensive collection uh, active, uh, action clauses and some of this has already uh, been uh, agreed in the last uh, summit. And uh, importantly, this also interacts with the question of sovereign exposures um, uh, because uh, if you reduce bank holdings of domestic sovereign exposures, this also lowers the costs of debt restructuring. Then the third issue is that uh, there is a need for, uh, for fiscal uh, stabilization so maybe I would slightly disagree with what Bruno said. So Bruno said that we need uh, um, fiscal risk sharing in order to deal with structural divergencies. So this is not the point that, uh, that I would uh, uh, make here. So for structural issues, I wouldn't use such a, uh, such a mechanism. Um, there you need other, other types of, of mechanism. But why is there a need for fiscal stabilization in the first place? So the one is that the national fiscal space can be insufficient in, in spite of responsible behavior. Then, of course, there is this idea that it would be much better to have the insurance uh, through the uh, financial sector, through financial integration. However, if we look at the progress made in financial integration, I think it's very unlikely that we are going to achieve the desirable level of risk sharing uh, in, the, um, in the medium uh, run, and therefore I think this has to be complemented by a fiscal um, mechanism. 
Then it has also been argued that uh, we already have stabilization through the ESM programs, but I don't think it's a good idea to use them as a substitute for macroeconomic stabilization. In fact, the nice thing about something like a fiscal capacity is that it can act as an automatic stabilizer. And I also think it can be designed in a way that takes into account all the moral hazard problems that, uh, that come with it. And they also help to prevent uh, these um, uh, long-term um, permanent uh, transfers. So these are things like a reinsurance principle, ex-ante conditionality, experience ratings, and, uh, and so on. But even um, if we are not able to deal with all incentive uh, problems perfectly, this doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't introduce such instruments because these downsides still have to be weighed against uh, the potential benefits from uh, stabilization. And uh, remember that if we have more stabilization, this may actually help us to make the market discipline more credible. So what types of stabilization instruments could we uh, consider? One is the European unemployment uh, insurance uh, against large uh, shocks. So the trigger would be a large uh, shock, for example, to uh, to the uh, unemployment uh, rate, and there would be a one-time transfer, so not a loan, but a transfer, um, so it's, it would not be uh, repayable. It would be financed uh, through national contr uh, contributions, which would have an experience rating, meaning that if a country taps the funds, it will have higher contributions uh, in the uh, future, and there should not be borrowing of the, no borrowing of the fiscal capacity. And uh, finally, there should be ex ante conditionality, uh, meaning that a country would be allowed to access uh, this fund only when uh, it complies uh, with the rules. A second uh, instrument, which is also already uh, discussed and partly even already exists, is a liquidity line at the, at the ESM, which uh, would allow for uh, access to short-term liquidity at relatively low rates without having to apply for a regular ESM uh, a program. And uh, so there would be ex-ante conditionality, relatively strict ex-ante conditionality, uh, but no um, uh, or very little exposed conditionality. Some people say, oh, oh, if you design it like that, it will never be used. But maybe that's not even an issue here, because such a liquidity line may help to stabilize expectations uh, in a way that a country with sound fundamentals basically cannot lose market uh, excess, and then uh, this instrument would already have served its purpose. Yeah, yeah that's fine, I'm, I'm almost done. So an important issue, as also discussed by Bruno, is how do we deal with the political resistance that we're uh, seeing? And uh, I think it has to start uh, by uh, convincing both politicians and the population that uh, that the euro area is actually unstable in its current form uh, and that something uh, has to be done. At the same time, the uh, stable euro area also contributes to stronger economic growth and also helps to strengthen the role of Europe in the world. And this view that we can simply wait and don't do anything um, or that we wait for the next crisis are actually very bad uh, options, and uh, I, I really think that this is not the view that uh, the euro area should take, and Bruno said something very similar. It's clear that it's, it will always be very hard to implement one of the reforms, um, uh, because uh, um, there, there will always be opposition from, from one side uh, or the other. So it's clear that we need to form packages, but not only for political reasons, but also for uh, economic reasons. And this, of course, means that all sides will have to cross some of their red lines. And maybe it would actually help if some of the issues were discussed in the public a bit less emotionally. So um, if I look at the discussion about EDIS in Germany, uh, it's, uh, it's a nightmare. So uh, there are so many wrong stories about uh, EDIS being told by, by German newspapers and being repeated again and again. This is a serious issue, and I think politicians should stand up and say, well, we do see there are some issues, but um, uh, we should uh, also see the point that there is a reason why other people are asking for EDIS. 
And so uh, we need a much less emotional uh, debate on these uh, things, and certainly these red lines shouldn't be an excuse not to do anything. We also need firm commitments on uh, both sides. So when I uh, think of this debate about uh, risk reduction and risk sharing, um, um, I think that uh, many member states uh, in the euro area had the impression that this target of risk uh, reduction was something like a moving target, which was adjusted always uh, at the time when some countries came close to achieving the goal of risk reduction. Now, of course, this is not good. So we should have commitments on, uh, on all sides. What are the preconditions and what are the consequences? And finally, uh, I think one uh, has to take into account the political developments when designing uh, economic um, uh, programs. I'm, uh, I mean, uh, when we think about uh, what has been called the austerity programs, I mean, there are uh, economic arguments uh, why you could say that these were actually needed, but we also have to be aware of the fact that they probably contributed to political polarization, which now makes reform much more difficult. And therefore, I think we have to take these uh, issues uh, into account um, uh, more broadly. And so let me come to the conclusion. So, um, I mean, after uh, the, uh, the events in Italy, some people have argued, so now we cannot do anything anymore because uh, Italy is not uh, playing according to the rules, but I think this is a very bad idea. Actually, Italy should not be used as an excuse uh, to delay the reforms, but quite the opposite. It should show us how urgent the reforms uh, actually are. And I think it would be very un unwise, both from the German, German and French perspective, to reject any further risk sharing or market discipline. And instead, we should put our energy into thinking about how we can design incentive compatible uh, mechanisms for risk sharing. And uh, of course, you may say, well, if the next crisis comes, let's say next year, no, nothing of this will have been implemented, so it comes too late anyway. But I think um, th this is partly true, of course, this will take time, Europe has always been uh, a bit slow. But we should be aware of the fact that this would have important implications uh, for expectations. So it may help to stabilize the expectations regarding the future of the euro area and the willingness to reform the euro area in order to, to um, to make the euro sustainable. And this is where I want to stop. Thank you very much for your attention. So, thank you very much for presenting this uh, comprehensive report, uh, for making uh, all these uh, suggestions for uh, the, a good future of this Europe, as we only have this one. So, I open up uh, to the floor questions, please. Andreas Wörgeter, and uh, this is And Andreas Wörgeter. It's in the same row. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I have been introduced already, so Andreas Wörgeter. Um, I'm retired, but um, modifying what Ewald Novotny yesterday said about central bankers, I would say once economist, always economist. Now, my question to, to both uh, speakers <coughs> is um, to answer my, let's say, um, yeah, <coughs> insecurity to, to see how these reforms that you are proposing for the euro area, the completing of uh, European Monetary Union, uh, how this will make um, both Germany and Italy happily living in this European uh, Monetary Union in the future. Well, what I mean is, I can say in two examples. <clears throat> one is when one listens to discussions about uh, how to reform the, <clears throat> the Euro area, one always has the feeling that in Germany this is seen as an issue that, that um, uh, concerns Italy, but not Germany. Yeah, I mean, Italy should reform, Italy should behave better, Italy should uh, let uh, <coughs> discipline 
be applied more strictly, and so on and so on. And Germany doesn't need to do any reforms because it is functioning. Now here I would say that the strength and the well-performing German economy to some extent um, depends on the weakness and the underperformance of the Italian economy. And so reform from that point of view I would consider should be more symmetric than what you have proposed here. I mean, the other example <coughs> is uh, the issue of labor mobility. Yes, okay, labor mobility, fine. The Italians and the Spanish should move north and <coughs> learn German or maybe the Germans should learn Italian or maybe all of them should learn French. Um, so, I mean, there are restrictions there and therefore I'm a bit skeptical whether labor mobility is the real way out of the missing European convergence. So to come to an end, how can we make both the North, let's say Germany and the South, Italians happily living in the Euro area of the future? Graham Bishop? No. Uh, Arno Becker from the Bundesbank. I share the views of Andreas Wörgeter on the um, problems of labor mobility. So if you want more convergence, capital obviously needs to move to where people are. Um, in that context, I'm a bit surprised, uh, Bruno, that you didn't uh, focus more on the investment climate. You focused a lot on short-term indicators like price competitiveness and so on. But if you look at... Uh, large differences in, in uh, factors which determine the investment climate, political stability or instability, the tax regime, um, government services as reflected in the World Bank's doing business indicators. You see that there is a large, uh, largely different uh, culture for, and, and therefore largely different attractiveness for capital in the different EU member states. And in so far, I think, your uh, analysis would benefit from in, uh, enlarging um, in, into that area, what determines um, capital investment. And um, side remark on the real uh, effective exchange rate, you started with 99. I think that gives a, could, could uh, give a wrong impression of uh, the situation in Germany, because Germany, you might well argue that Germany entered EMU or locked in with a overvalued uh, exchange rate. And what you see in that picture when you start with 99, you might get a wrong impression that Germany uh, devaluate, devalu uh, depreciated uh, in, in real terms. And if you start a little bit earlier, you see that uh, you come from a completely different picture. Thank you. I take two more questions, uh, which is uh, Aurel Schubert uh, and Graham Bishop next to him. Okay, Aure Schubert, uh, Vienna University of Economics and, and Business. Just a question uh, to Ms. Schnabel uh, on this uh, common unemployment insurance. Basically, sounds like a good idea, but as, as uh, Bruno has shown before, labor markets are extremely heterogeneous in Europe. And so change in the unemployment rate, but also changes in the unemployment rate, which you want to reinsure, are, are not God-given, but they are policy-made. And, uh, and so the question is, how do you want to deal with this? Or isn't it a precondition that you would need much more harmonization in, in labor markets because the differences are, are to a large extent uh, policy made and there are uh, reasons why unemployments are, are so different from, from European countries. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Graham Bishop. Um, I think both speakers seem to be agreed that uh, a greater degree of financial integration is necessary. Um, and so one of the questions is, how is that to be achieved? How are we going to get uh, banking union on track? How are we going to get capital markets union? And of course, referring back to yesterday, um, how are we going to enhance the international role of the dollar, of the, of the euro, sorry, the euro. <laughs> the slip. Um, so the, the, I think the answer to that is going to be a safe asset. Now, um, uh, that will be part of, it's not the only thing, but the safe asset will certainly be part of this process. And the question is, what sort of safe asset? Now, we've talked about SPBS as very long-dated uh, securities. I think that's a problem. I have proposed an idea of a temporary euro bill fund, uh, which is up to two years, and actually could start shorter, up to two years, mature, uh, two, uh, 
three months or six months maturities. So this would provide banks with a safe asset very quickly, could be done very quickly indeed, well before any crisis might come. I think we need to think about such things. Um, I'm not going to go into the details now, but there is a SWERF paper which I published about three or four months ago, which sets out 30 frequently asked questions on it. So, and just one last point while I have the microphone. We've talked a little bit about Brexit. Um, look at the local election results which are unfolding today. In my view, and I'm strongly committed to the UK remaining in the EU, this is a major sharp move towards Brexit being cancelled and we remain in the EU. Look at the election results by the end of today. Very interesting. Okay, I come back to the speakers. I ask for short answers because then we can make a second and final round of questions in the audience. Please. Okay, so I'll try to be short. Uh, the uh, main point I wanted to, uh, to do is the fact that you cannot take for granted that integration uh, will mean uh, more uh, real convergence. And uh, maybe uh, it could be the contrary. It seems that in the case of the euro area, there is a sort of uh, uh, middle uh, income trap and uh, that uh, after uh, a certain level of convergence, uh, then uh, even more integration doesn't produce, uh, doesn't produce convergence. And if you, took, if you are taking the example of the US, uh, then it's uh, really uh, striking that uh, the uh, convergence between uh, states in the US has not, uh, has not increased and the level of integration of the US market is uh, uh, probably uh, something which uh, the uh, EMU will not reach even uh, at the uh, 2038 uh, horizon. So uh, we have to live with that and uh, it's also a problem of um, narrative because um, we have sold also the uh, European and Monetary Union uh, as a, a way to uh, have a, a convergent prosperity and uh, this is something uh, which is uh, probably uh, out, of, uh, out of hand. Uh, or uh, we have to have the right uh, structural policy and uh, there is something uh, missing in, the, uh, in Isabel's proposals is uh, how to incentivize uh, state to do the right uh, long-term structural policy, for example, in the education system. Uh, even market discipline doesn't produce uh, in any case, uh, incentives for a good uh, policy for education or for good policy for uh, the next generation, I would say. So, um, I, I acknowledge that there are, there is a, there are very big divergences in the, uh, in the in investment uh, climate uh, in, uh, in Europe, um, but uh, this is not true, for example, in the US market. Uh, I guess the political stability is the same in the South and the North, in the, um, in, in, in the Midwest, and it doesn't, prevent, uh, the, um, uh, the, it doesn't prevent the fact that there, is, there are a lot of divergences, uh, real uh, divergences. So uh, again, uh, it's something uh, which we uh, have to deal with, uh, both in terms of uh, acceptance and narratives, and also in terms of finding incentives uh, for uh, states to have uh, very good, uh, well, to have better, at least, uh, structural, uh, structural uh, reform uh, pro programs. Isabel, how to convince Germans and Italians? <laughs> so maybe I, I just uh, first start with uh, wh what you said before, because I actually think it's very important. So we need, uh, we need incentives or stronger incentives for, uh, uh, for structural reforms, and not only that, we have to facilitate it to implement structural reforms, even if the macroeconomic environment may be unfavorable. Therefore, I think we really have to think more about this um, idea of, um, of linking the, the structural funds uh, to, to structural reforms. And um, I, I think that would be a very, uh, very important uh, issue. And the, uh, actually, the report didn't focus on these longer term issues. And you're perfectly right that we have to think about them um, very carefully. This is also a bit related to, to uh, Oral's uh, question. So I don't think that, uh, that there is the need to harmonize um, labor markets, but of course we, uh, we have to deal uh, with the issue that um, uh, the situation in the labor market um, is of course to a, uh, to a large extent uh, policy made. And um, so my response would be that you have to try to design the, uh, the, the unemployment uh, reinsurance system uh, 
in a way that tries to take that into account. So by linking the contributions to the fund uh, to the, uh, the structural characteristics uh, of the uh, of the labor market, and uh, that would be uh, very important. Just as uh, in any insurance which link uh, would link the uh, contributions uh, to the underlying um, uh, risks. So regarding Germany uh, and Italy, I mean, it's actually a lot about narratives. You mentioned that word uh, several times, and I think that's extremely important. We have so many wrong narratives floating around, and that is, um, that is something that uh, worries me a lot. And one of the narratives in Germany, of course, is that it's always Italy. So when I give presentations, I sometimes ask the audience, so what do you think? So how much money did, uh, uh, did Germany pay to Italy in the, in the last crisis? And then I say some random numbers. And then I'm aware of the fact that they, they, people have no understanding, that they don't really know what's going on, but there is this narrative that it's always uh, Italy that we are paying for. And um, that is very uh, unfortunate, and we have to get rid of these, uh, of these wrong um, narratives, which I think is a very important precondition to um, moving uh, on towards your area reform. So, um, uh, I also think it's, a, it's, um, it's not a good uh, perspective to say that the strength of, uh, of some countries depends on the weakness uh, of others. I think what, uh, what your graphs also showed is that in many dimensions, actually, we are all not uh, in a very good situation. If you take demographics, right? So there we have an issue in all countries, so such issues won't be solved by... Uh, I don't know, uh, Eastern Europeans uh, moving to Germany, solving the demographic problem there, because then you have a, a, a worse problem uh, elsewhere. And so, of course, we have to think in, uh, in European terms, and I think that would be very important. Very briefly on the safe assets, so I think we have to discuss it um, more. I mean, uh, there are now quite a few proposals on the table, uh, on the table and yours is, uh, is uh, one of them. And uh, I think we have to take that very seriously. I think for political reasons, uh, there should not be a mutualization in the current uh, uh, situation. Uh, but there are proposals that, um, that may be able to achieve that. And um, um, I agree that, uh, there, uh, that this could also play a very important uh, role for financial integration in the euro area. Okay. Last chance for questions. Uh, Yes, there's one. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm Suzanne Bishopric from Global Sovereign Advisors, and I want to know how you will exploit the next crisis, which tends to happen when you're not planning it. What would be your first priority to get something reformed in an emergency crisis situation? And there was a question uh, in the back. Martin Larch, I'm working for the European Fiscal Board. I have a question for Professor Schnabel. First of all, I, I would like to say that I personally share very much uh, your uh, analysis, which is also um, very nicely explained in the report that you referred to. Um, this analysis gives rise to a very long list of uh, policy proposals. In order to implement uh, these policy proposals, you need uh, political capital, and political capital is uh, limited. Now, if you, had to now, if you had to now indicate the first two priorities from your point of view on which to invest, uh, invest the, the limited political capital, what would these two uh, priorities be? Thank you. And then there were <coughs> two questions. Uh, they are in the middle row. Carl Pichelmann, okay. Carl Pichelmann, European Commission. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, I think we have to take into account the, the political constraints that we, that we are facing. Uh, I mean, let me quote from say, the, 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 the Council conclusions uh, of last December, uh, where, which stated that we could not agree on the need and the design of a fiscal stabilization mechanism for the euro area. So not only... It, it was not only a question of the design of a mechanism, it was the need of a mechanism that is uh, uh, where, where there is no consensus. Uh, so, therefore, uh, I think there is, uh, <coughs> I mean, this question by, by Martin, I mean, where we should now, uh, our, our, our priorities, uh, 
uh, I mean, really is, uh, is a pressing one. Uh, let me uh, use, as I have the, the mic also, I mean, a short commercial uh, uh, on, uh, on in-house work that is going on in the European Commission. Uh, I mean, we are now working on what is called uh, a budgetary instrument for uh, convergence and competitiveness, uh, which indeed would try to bring elements uh, of incentivizing uh, medium-term structural reforms uh, uh, into, into the picture. Uh, and my question would be, I mean, whether you would uh, see this uh, as, uh, say, a first uh, little step uh, in the right direction. Thank you very much. And now I have two final questions. The one goes to uh, Franz Nauschnick and to, to the gentleman on, on the edge of the table. Uh, Franz Nauschnick, I have, I have one question. Uh, you proposed uh, debt restructuring, but if you look back at the crisis, uh, we had, we had uh, two different uh, ways. Uh, in 2009, Austria and Greece, we had the same CDS spreads, so markets expected that the default of Austria uh, with the same probability as the default of Greece. We uh, went in the way of a so-called Vienna Initiative uh, because uh, our risk was exposure to Central and Eastern Europe via our banking system. We had uh, kept the exposure of the banks there, which worked out quite nicely, and uh, Central and Eastern Europe was uh, stabilized with a fraction of uh, official funds uh, that flowed into Greece. Whereas in Greece, we had debt restructuring with huge contagion effects on, on all the peripheral countries. Uh, and we had uh, the banks running from Greece. So when the German banks uh, started to run, they inflicted huge losses on the other banks. The French banks were not too happy, as Bruno well knows. Uh, so. Uh, isn't it uh, better to have uh, an instrument like the Vienna Initiative instead of a step restructuring? Do you give the hand over the micro? Thank you. So I'm Stefan Gerla from, e from EFG. Um, uh, one way to think about this is one can think about sort of systemic system uh, style questions and Isabel asked those, I thought it was a very persuasive uh, presentation she, she gave. One can also ask structural question, and Bruno uh, raised these, in particular the issue of education. And I think these structural questions are, don't get enough play in the, uh, in the discussion. I think they are very important. In the presentation that I actually gave earlier in Vienna this year, I asked the question, how did the countries that had a crisis, that had to ask for help, how do they structurally differ from the countries in the, European, in the Euro area that did not have to ask for help? And it's quite instructive here. Um, for instance, these countries, they scored very poorly on the World Bank's measure of government effectiveness. They had high levels of perceived um, corruption. Um, and the killer variable actually was just the fraction of national income that the government uh, raised on average between two, uh, 1997 and 2007. The countries that raised more than 40%, they had, did not have a crisis. And the countries that raise less than 40% of government uh, revenue uh, of national revenue or national income and government uh, in, uh, in of national income and government revenue, they all had a crisis. Now, how should we think about this? And I think what's really going on is the, cri the countries that did have a crisis, they have ineffective, weak governments. They cannot tax, they cannot enforce the laws, they have problems with corruption and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, Bruno's point about you know, doing something with the structure, education, uh, rule of law, and so on and so forth, become hugely important. I, I, I completely agree with Isabel's analysis that you have to run the system in a better way, and I think this is a very persuasive plan. But we should not lose sight of the fact that these countries had a problem, and they had problems for reasons that are pretty clear once you start looking at how well the government operates in these countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, thank you very much, Stefan, for this uh, last question. Uh, in fact, we did uh, some studies in the Bank of France showing that the uh, uh, tax collection elasticity in countries like uh, Greece, for example, on the uh, VAT is uh, close to zero. So uh, in a case like that, uh, of course, you are less resilient to, uh, uh, to uh, a fiscal, um, a fiscal uh, shock. Um, and 
uh, again, uh, just to, to come back, there, there is a question I didn't answer to, uh, was the, the question on the, uh, the graph on the uh, real effective exchange rate. And it is true that the divergence uh, between uh, the four main uh, euro area uh, was uh, just the consequence of nominal convergence uh, before and uh, just after, uh, after the euro. So the uh, nominal convergence, uh, in fact, uh, triggered uh, real divergence uh, in terms of uh, unit labor cost uh, following, the, um, uh, following the euro. So uh, it would have been shown uh, if uh, the graph has begun before uh, 19, uh, 1989. Um, maybe a, la a, a last point. Um, we are talking a lot about private risk sharing linked to the capital market union, and it's true that this is something which is uh, linked to uh, improving and to harmonize uh, the uh, investment climate uh, all around the euro area. But if you look, for example, at the, uh, at the US, uh, one big uh, uh, channel of uh, private risk sharing is labor mobility. And uh, in a way to solve the uh, problem not <coughs> of uh, cyclical uh, uh, unemployment, but of divergence of uh, the level of unemployment rate, which is still very high in the euro area, very, um, it's, 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 it's uh, mainly labor mobility, especially if you don't want to have a public, uh, permanent public transfer. So probably there is a trade-off between, uh, between the two, but uh, I don't see uh, any uh, other solutions uh, uh, than, than, than that, probably. Thank you. So these were qu quite a few questions. I will try to be brief. So uh, one issue, uh, which were basically the first two questions, were which, uh, which reforms I would give a priority. And I, I think the priority should be given to the financial sector uh, reforms because uh, I think that uh, that the the most uh, serious threat to stability in the in the shorter run is really the sovereign bank nexus. This is related to many other things, but I think this is the issue that we really should um, tackle with a high uh, priority, which then uh, includes um, resolution deposit uh, insurance and sovereign uh, exposure. So I think this should, this should have a clear uh, priority. Uh, so um, I, I think it's, um, it's unfortunate that there's no agreement on the, on the need for uh, fiscal stabilization. Uh, and um, uh, of course, I think the, uh, the, uh, the principle behind this budgetary instrument, I mean, is, 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 is good. I mean, the idea is uh, well taken. But um, it doesn't solve the issue of uh, stabilization. And um, regarding um, financial integration, I mean, I already said that uh, probably this, this won't be enough because it takes too long, but also because in crisis times it will always be difficult to achieve a risk sharing uh, through, uh, through financial markets. It's easier through equity, but with debt it's always very, uh, very difficult. And therefore I think uh, we need uh, fiscal stabilization in addition and also uh, related to the, uh, to the political reasons that I mentioned at the end of my uh, presentation, that, I mean, one nice thing about the, the European uh, unemployment insurance is that it also shows um, the, um, the people in the countries hit by a crisis that Europe is doing some, something for them. And I think this is something that also shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, regarding this comparison between Greece and Austria, I think this is a bit mistaken uh, because just the fact that the spreads were similar doesn't mean that the situation was similar. And in fact, the situation was dramatically different. And therefore, I do not think that the same recipe that worked in, um, in Austria, which I think is, is fine and uh, uh, so it's, uh, it was well done, but this wouldn't have worked for Greece. So uh, therefore, I mean, I think there can be situations, and as I said, this should only be a last resort, but there can be situations where these kind of recipes simply don't work anymore because the, uh, the situation uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't allow for that. And maybe I, I stop here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, presenting this report, which uh, was uh, very much welcomed uh, also from our point of view as it brings uh, the debate forward, and this, this is uh, very important.
So thank you both for coming. Uh, thank you all for joining this debate, for joining the discussion. It was a very lively morning. Uh, uh, and with this, uh, I want uh, to hand over to the governor who